everyone, it's me, Catherine. I'm Needleberry Stitcher, and I'm back with another video. It's been a couple of months. I think my last video was the very end of December when I was talking about my 2023 whip go plans, and I did a whip parade in December as well of all of my whips and works in progress. Um, it's been a couple of months. Uh, I kept telling myself I need to film another video and every time I would try I just didn't get around to it and I'm sorry it's been so long but um, I'll do life updates at the end I have reasons for my absence and which some of you may can probably guess if you follow me on Instagram um, but anyway I decided today today's the day I'm gonna come back I'm gonna film another video catch you guys up on what I've worked on hasn't been a lot. I'll be completely honest. I started out January really, really strong. First couple weeks I was working on a lot of projects, um, a lot being like maybe three or four. Um, but then um, I started a new job and then other stuff. So anyway, I'll get into the life updates at the end, like I said. But what I'll do is I will show you what I have gotten done in the last couple of months. I'll start by saying, if you watched my last video when I talked about WIPGO, um, many of you are doubters and you um, are like, I really don't think you'll be able to keep up with WIPGO this year. And I know that. <laughs> I deep down really know, like, I, I know I'm not good at following rigid plans uh, because that's what I do at work all day. So when I come home and I'm working in, on my projects and my, my hobbies, I'm not really... Um, not wanting to follow very rigid guidelines and rules and I like having goals um, but that's all they are though they're goals they're not requirements they're not mandates they're just for fun and I think when I started out this year with WIPGO plans I knew I wouldn't make it all the way through the year um, I thought I'd make it a little further than the third week of January but that's okay um, I, I at least got a couple of really good stitching weeks at the beginning of the year and I feel like I made good progress on some of them um, and I haven't stitched a lot since then. Um, after about the third week of January things have kind of fizzled. I've picked up a couple of things but not a lot of progress but I want to show you what I have. So I don't remember if I showed you my start and I'm, I'm not going back to look at my last videos to see what I showed you and what I didn't. Um, what I'm gonna do is just show you what I think I've done since the last time I talked to you, and we'll just go with that. So getting into it, I started, I had a new start. I may have showed you. I know I talked about it. Um, it's Joan Elliott, and it's called Princess of the Snows. And I started this one with Amanda, Lucky Chance Stitcher, and this was a project I started to learn how to stitch in hand. And so I did start it, stitching in hand. Um, I did a little bit and then I tried. Honestly, people, I tried. It just wasn't either. It's not the right time for me to learn how to stitch in hand or I'm just really not good at it. Um, it's going to take practice and it's going to have to be when I'm in a super stitchy point where I actually have a lot of time and I have a lot of dedication. And right now I don't. Um, where did I put it? Hold on. Oh, It's over here. I forgot that I took it off of my stretcher bars. This is as far as I got with it in hand. And then I put it on stretcher bars or not stretcher, like, well, scroll rods. And then I haven't done it again. So this is as far as I got with, sorry for the lighting. That's as far as I got with stitching in hand. And it doesn't look bad. I just, I'm just not really very good at it. So anyway, this fabric is gorgeous. For the life of me, I can't remember what it is. I used to know something with ice. You guys probably remember. Uh, let me see. I probably still have the tag. What was it called? It was um, Cracked Ice. It's a 28 count Lugana Cracked Ice by Pole Stitches. That's what that fabric was. All right, and I'll be spinning around. This chair, 
I have to sit really low now in this chair for some reason it decided that when the lever that makes it go up and down decided that when you put it up it doesn't want to stay there anymore so it just like keeps going down so I, I'll put it up and then it just slowly starts to go down so I feel like I'm sitting really low today in this video because I usually sit up a little higher but anyway all it means is that you can see a whole bunch of more of the collection of stuff I have in my my cubicle cubby things um, oh, that's not a whip. I, so I'm going to have to admit something before showing you the next thing. I went into a bit of a frenzy trying to find Magnifica beads because I watched Fiber Arts Amy and she said, oh yeah, by the way, and this was, a, you know, a couple months ago, three months ago, she's like, Magnifica beads are discontinued. And I was like, oh yeah, I think I heard that somewhere, but I totally forgot about it. So here's all the Magnifica beads that are no longer available. Bead packs are hard to find for some of the older ones so I went on a bit of a it was a it was quite a scavenger hunt uh, a lot of online shops and eBay and finding just trying to find um Magnifica beads I went through every single Mirabilia pattern not the Nora's just the Mirabilia's and I looked on the back of every single pattern and I wrote down how many beads Magnifica beads only because they start with a certain number they start with I think it's zero one no one so it's a five digit number that starts with a one and it's it, they're all like one zero zero four one or one zero 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 one or one zero zero one zero so if you see on a pattern uh, a, a a mill hill bead and it starts with one zero zero or one zero one uh, and it's five digits those are the magnificas so they're still they're still putting them in the bead packs um and this I know because uh, Amanda, Lucky Chance Stitcher, told me that. And I have confirmed the, the new bead packs that they're selling um, for the new Mirabilias that, as they release them are still containing those Magnifica beads. So they're just not selling them individually. I don't know why. I And I don't really care to look into it. I found as many as I could find readily and I'll just have to figure out how to substitute. I know um, Michael sells... Um, the Delica beads, the, they sell Toho's, not very many, but they sell some Toho beads. And they also sell the um, Miyuki beads, which are the Delicas. And they have black. They have like the pearl black and they have the flat black. They have the pearl white, which is like the, the glistening. And they have the flat white. And they have some of the other colors in between. And if I run out and can't find, I'll, I'll either color match or I'll... Kind of, I know there's some websites online too where you can um, get the Toho beads and I'll just figure something out. I'll substitute if I have to. I found what I could. I think I've got enough beads for for the patterns that I know about but or that I have. Okay, I'm rambling now. Let's go on to the next one. So another project I worked on in January and this was part of um, the very beginning of January when I was actually cruising along with Whipgo, and, I, and I've pretty much abandoned Whipgo at this point. I mean, if I didn't make that clear a few minutes ago, I'm doesn't mean I'm not going to work on a lot of different projects this year. I might. Right now, I just feel like working on one or two things, and I have those one or two things that I'm working on, and I'll show you what those are at the end. Um, so the next one was Stitch an Inch Fall, What's that? and this is by the Bay Needle Arts. And I am doing it as a full, that you can do each of these individual little scenes, or you can do them all together. And I'm doing them all as one big scene all the way across. And it's one inch by seven inches or seven blocks. So it's very tiny. I'm doing it one over one full cross on 28 count even weave. And I, I got all the way to, I got all the way to one side which I'm really happy about. So I basically picked a color and stitched that color all the way across to this side. And then I picked another color and stitched that one all the way across. And then I picked another color. And so I was doing color by color on, as I worked on this one and I was enjoying that. But I think it's coming along really nicely. I'll hold it up a little bit closer. Love, love that color. And it's a, um, it's a, it's a, hand dyed floss. It's a variegated hand dyed for the sky, that peachy pink sky color. Let's see if I can find it. 
I don't think I have it in this uh, in my project bag anymore because I I've stitched all of it. It's it's all done. But it's that beautiful variegated color in the sky. So that is my progress on that one. And I do have some stats. Like I did very religiously or diligently. Um, Oh, I didn't put the pattern back in. I'm sorry. I, if I don't put stuff away, um, I won't be able to find it later. All right. Um, let me see if I can pull up my stats. Uh, I started using Brian Blitz Stitch's app called Cross Stitch Journal. And even now when I stitch, I'm still capturing um, the, I use the timer feature. So I know what I stitched on and how long I stitched on it. So I'm, I'm still kind of keeping track of those metrics. I'm, I'm just not being very, I'm just not stitching very much, but when I do stitch, I am, I am looking at it. So let's see, what did I stitch in? I gotta remember how to get to the chart. Summary by year and how many days. All right, I stitched on, stitch an inch fall for three days in January, was it January, let me see. Yeah, I stitched on, I stitched on, um, stitch an inch fall. I did one thousand about three days, 1,382 stitches for a total of 9.1 hours in January. So I think that was pretty good. The next one I pulled out, I was super excited about. Um, actually before that, let me show you I, I have to show you a different one that I worked on so every month which unfortunately let me start over so on the second day calendar day of every month I have a I'm stitching with uh, Mama Carmen 2 on Instagram and she's CJ stitches on YouTube we are doing a stitch along and so the idea is that we're not we were working, we work on it on the same day, not necessarily at the same time. We don't have a scheduled time, but um, we are both working on the same project. So we have, listen, I'm sorry for all of the wrinkling. Um, this is a Heaven and Earth Designs um, and it's artwork by Adele Sessler. It's called Beloved. And I'm working on the supersized version. And this is what it looks like. This is a fun one because it doesn't have as many colors as other super size patterns. Um, it has 45 colors, but it's it's because it's the monochromatic and it's just the, um, you know, black and white gray scale. Um, it, it just, I'm not saying that it's still not a whole lot of confetti, but it is kind of nice to have a, a few, a few less colors to, to work with. So now this is a weird one that I did. Um, and I actually don't even remember which way is up and which way is... Oh, it, it, yes, I do. I can tell by the threads, the way they're hanging. Okay, so this... Um, I'm going to show it because it looks really weird. But when I was working on this one last summer, when I started it, I was doing kind of a checkerboard pattern on it, which is really, really weird. Um, but I was trying to keep my interest. I guess it was last, early last summer. Um, so I picked a block and then I would work a, a temp, I would work 20 by 20 and did a checkerboard style. I'm doing it on 25 count Lugana. So anyway, enough, I'll show you. So it looks weird and I apologize, but when I came back and worked on it in January, I actually just picked some colors and, and tried to work them all wherever I found them. So that's, it's starting to fill in. So I basically just put my Q-snap on around this whole area and then I'm just trying to fill in different colors in different places. So still looks kind of wonky, but I mean, I'll get it filled in at some point and it won't look quite so checkerboard-ish. Um, someone had mentioned, you know, when you do the checkerboards and you have those hard fixed lines, just to be careful because it can sometimes leave that those square marks as you move along because there's a hard break with where your thread, it's not crossing, it's like got a hard line. Um, I haven't found that to be an issue yet, but once I start filling it in, I'll let you know if I start to see that, but I think part of it sometimes can be tension. Um, I do use... Uh, Q snap and I, I try and hold pretty good tension on things and I try not to pull my threads too tight and I also always have my threads going in 
different directions and I cross over different places. So it, it just keeps things from being, you know, go one way and then you go back the other and you go back and then you go back the other. It does leave that hard line. So I try and zigzag all over the place. So the, the um, threads in the back are kind of messy, but I think that helps a little bit with not having those hard lines. And one thing I have to say about the beloved stitch together thing is I did it in January, February came and I was not able to do it on the second and then March came and I wasn't able to do it on the second of March either. So um, CJ stitches, I'm sorry that I haven't been keeping up. April's looking really good for me to be able to work on it with you. So don't forget about me. Um, I keep going for the wrong project bags. Uh, I have a whole pile of them sitting here on a chair with the ones that I'm trying to kit up and they, every time I just naturally gravitate over to that stack and it's not the right stack. It's actually, maybe I should, I don't know if I'll put in a picture here, but I've got like, I don't know, maybe 25 Mirabilia's that I'm slowly, as I accumulate materials and beads and threads and I'm slowly kidding them up. Uh, I, I, I know I don't need to work on any more Mirabilia's. I have enough and I need to finish what I started, but there's something about having them at least kitted up that I could work on them if I wanted to. I, you know, that, there's just something nice about that. There's another one I worked on. Oh, you know what? I have the, I have the stats for that. Hold on. For the beloved. Let me pull up the stats real quick. In normal fashion, I'm all over the place. And that's just how it rolls. It's how I roll anyway. I'm not very organized when it comes to this. And again, it's because I'm like, I have to be meticulously organized at work. So this is all just loosey goosey because this is how I can unpack and enjoy my hobby. I don't have to organize it meticulously for anyone else but me. Beloved, I worked on one day. I completed 1,087 stitches and I worked on it for 7.4 hours that day. I want to say I was off work. I think the 2nd of January I was not working because I was in between jobs. I had one week off after I ended my last job at the end of December and started a new job in January. On January 9th I started a new job, so I had a week off there, which is why I got so much more stitching done. The next one I picked up, oh, love this one. I was really excited when when this one came up in my initial WIPCO plans when it got called because I really wanted to work on this one early and it's Atlantic Seaboard Sampler and it's a pattern by uh, Jeanette Douglas Designs. Hold it up a little closer. If you can't tell the Atlantic Seaboard Sampler is a Canadian sampler and this is Green Gables at the top. I love that. And there's all these different bands that go down and each one represents something. Uh, and I'll show you what some of them are because I, I might actually still remember. Uh, I did a stupid thing and I put all of my threads all wrapped up in my fabric. I, why, I don't know why I do that. It's going to just take me a minute to, oh, good. I think I can, okay, I can show you without messing up the threads, I think. All right, so I'm going to show you how far I got. I'm really happy with how far I got on this one. All right, this is what I got done. So I got all of the house done and the row, I'll see if I can find it. But so this band, oh no, my threads are falling out. I'm, I'm a mess, such a mess. Hold on. I didn't take the time to put these threads on, the specialty threads on thread drops, and I should have, or cards or something. But anyway, they're all just kind of loosely folded into my fabric, which isn't working out very well for showing you. But all right, let's get back to. Okay, this is where I got to. Ah, oh, it's still not working. Hold on. Okay, we're going with it. All right, this is where I got to. So there's the house band, which I finished. This next band right here is called freckles, which are supposed to be uh, to represent Anne of Green Gables freckles. The next row down here are lupins, 
which are very, very popular in Eastern Canada, where I grew, I grew up in Eastern Canada, New Brunswick. And I absolutely love Eastern Canada. I miss it all the time. Um, and I used to go visit Anne of Green Gables, the property in Prince Edward Island. We used to go there in the summertime and tour it. And we spent a lot of time there. The next band here are Fiddleheads. If you're familiar with Fiddleheads, it's something that grows in the bogs. You can go pick them and eat them. They're kind of like asparagus, but they're kind of like a fern. And so they have like a curly little top on them. Um, but people just steam them, grill them, eat them. And then the next row here says one potato, two potato. So those are potatoes. Um, the next little band here, I, I honestly don't remember if that was the, the earth, the red sand. Um, I can't remember that one. The next one down is representing the ocean right here. The next are apple trees with golden and red apples and another band of apples. And so, and then the writing there says Annapolis Valley. So that's, that's where I got to. I'm really happy with the progress on this. That's, it's about a third of the way done. And I think that's pretty good. Um, if I pick it up and work on it, um, let me check my stats. I forget how many days I worked on it. I think it was maybe two or three. I put the, this away. And then, all right, let me check my stats. How long did I work on that? Three days that I worked on it. And I did 1,822 stitches and I worked on it for 18.5 hours. And again, that first week of January, I was um, off work, so I was able to stitch a lot more. All right. Okay, the next one I stitched on, I don't have the picture with me right now. It's, I think it's upstairs, but I'll show you a picture of what it is. It's Lady Claire which is a design by Lavender and Lace. I don't think I can actually unroll this right now. It's on my um, Millennium Frame. If that's like that. Yeah, it's a Millennium Frame. It's the only one that I have, um, but it, I find it really hard getting these side things off to be able to unroll it, and I'm not gonna unroll it for you. The only part of it that I worked on from the last time that I worked on it, which you should, should have seen a picture by now, all I did was just work up in this top corner and see how f that fabric is just so, it's very um, thin. I think it must be a witch elt. I think it's a witch elt, but anyway, um, I don't have anything to put behind it. I don't know. Oh, there I do. So that's all I, the only section that I worked on. So I have a little bit more from last time. I honestly didn't work on it a whole lot. Um, I had some other stuff that I decided to work on instead, but I think I worked on, yeah, I don't, rem... let me check my stats. I honestly don't remember how much I worked on it. Three days I worked on it. I only got 486 stitches. So I think this must have been when I first started my, my new job. Uh, just wasn't getting a lot of stitchy time, only maybe a couple of hours in the evening, maybe only even an hour, or I may not have worked on it at all. I don't remember. I just remember that this was what I was getting into when I, my new job, second week of January. Um, so 486 stitches and only 4.7 hours. So it was only, I stitched about a hundred stitches an hour, um, which I guess is pretty good, but Sometimes I can do a lot more than 100 in an hour, and this, but this one, there's a lot of confetti in this one and I'm not getting as many stitches in. The next one I picked up is, and it's one of my favorites, um, and it's one that I had as a goal last year. It's my Beauty and the Beast, which is a tilt and crafts pattern. I'll put a picture in of what, it, what it's gonna look like when it's done. I'm stitching it on 25 count even weave or Lugana. I think it's one or the other. And let's see if I can show you where it's at or where it was the last time I worked on it. I should 
probably already showed that. And this is where I'm at now. So I came down here and started working on this next page. Let me roll it up a little bit again. Okay. So I started working on this first page in the next row. So I've got the top two rows completely done here. There's a top row, a second row. I'm starting on the third row. And that's what I got done. Not a lot, but a little bit. Every little bit helps get me closer to finishing it. And this one, I, I'm really excited to get this one done. I, I'm not saying I'll get it done this year, but I do enjoy picking it up. Um, once I get it pulled out and on and on my, I have a Lowry stand. And once I get it on the stand, it's just, I just want to keep working on it. So that one I worked, let's see. Uh, what, surprisingly, I only worked on it for two days. It felt like a lot more. Like I felt like I worked on it. Well, no, I guess that makes sense. It's probably just in the evenings. Uh, and I did, um, 1,187 stitches for a total of 8.7 hours. So that was Beauty and the Beast. And there are two more that I worked on. One is called, the first one's called It Is Well With My Soul, or It Is Well. So it is well, do I have, I'll put the picture up here on the screen of what it looks like. I had very little started on it. It was something that I had started. So you, if you watched my whip parade at the end of 2022, it did have it in there, but I only had, I only had like a couple of letters done. It wasn't really very much. So, um, and this is where I got to, I'll hold this up like that. So that's where I got to, starting to make some good progress on it. There's only three colors in it, which makes it really easy to work on. They're variegated colors, so it gives it a little bit of, um, that variegation makes it look like there's more colors, but yeah. I think the only other one, the last one that I worked on is also one that I've showed you before. I started it last year. It's a Stony Creek design. And I'll put a picture in of what it looks like. It's called Red's Resting Place. I'll put a picture of what it looked like the last time that I showed you. And I'll show you where I'm at now. So it's getting there. I'm making some good progress on it. I started to prioritize this one because it's one that I'm doing for my dad and I really would like to get this one done sooner than later. And it's one of the reasons why I'm working on it um, more mono uh, monogamously and not working on a whole lot of other ones. So when I get chances to stitch, which hasn't been a lot lately, but when I do get a chance to stitch, I'm picking this one up almost exclusively. So that's, that's pretty much where it's at. Um, I did work on one other project. It was something that I, um, I'll talk about that in, in my life update, which I guess we're at that now. I'll, actually, I'm gonna do some stitchy kindness because I had some very wonderful, amazing stitching friends reach out and um, they sent me some stitchy kindness and I wanted to recognize those people that sent me some stitchy kindness. A couple of these are from further back than I it, they should be because it was even before my last videos that I did um, and I just had forgotten to put it in there but so my good stitchy friend Amanda, Lucky Chance Stitcher, had sent me some beautiful fabrics and some threads. Um, she sent me some beautiful hand dyed threads from Hand Dyed by Rolanda and she also sent me some fabrics. One is, um, it's called Hanami, and it's by Under the Sea Fabrics. Just beautiful, beautiful hand dyed fabric with lots of gorgeous, gorgeous colors in it. And she sent these at Christmas time. So thank you, Amanda. It was very sweet of you to send them. 
And she also sent me this one called Mermaid, Mermaid Mules by Fiberlicious. Just gorgeous. Look at the, I mean, it's called Mermaid for a reason. It's got, it's even got some greens and it's got some darker blues down here. It's got some, oh, it's absolutely beautiful. So thank you very much, Amanda. Very, very sweet of you to send those. Really appreciate your friendship. And let's see, I had another gift, uh, uh, Stitchy Kindness from CJ Stitches for Christmas. She also sent me a couple of patterns, um, their digital patterns, and I'm going to put pictures of the ones that up on the screen. They're just so beautiful. Um, two of them are from Heaven and Earth Designs. And the other one is from Cross Stitch Studio. And so I will put these up on the screen for you to see. And thank you so much, CJ Stitches, Mama Carmen too. Really appreciate your friendship too. I know you've, you've been there for me in so many ways in the last few months and really appreciate all, all of your friendship. I had some stitchy kindness from a, one of one of you viewers who um, won one of my giveaways a few months ago, the, the Santa Stamp Dimensions Kit, um, Leslie Maxwell. Thank you so much. She sent me some patterns and kits from Australia, which is amazing. Um, she sent me this cool little postcard with a beautiful note on it. Now I'm not going to read you all the notes because that's for me. Um, but anyway, a nice little um, card from Australia and a kit from Country Threads called ABC Bears. Isn't that adorable? I love teddy bears. And these are from local uh, Australian companies that manufacture. So there's, I mean, there's really not many opportunities or places for me to be able to buy these locally. Probably none. So thank you, Leslie, for sending them. They're... I, I mean, these are very precious to me because I I can't get them here. And she sent me this kit, which is Australia, Australiana counted cross stitch. And the next one is by Danico Design. Again, another Australian company, and it's, and it's called Koala. Isn't that adorable? This thing is so precious. So... Thank you very much. That was really super sweet. Um, and then my last stitchy kindness that I'll share with you. Um, my dear friend Fauna Pfeiffer reached out and um, sent me this very precious card with the sheep and the red barn. I mean, this is so peaceful. I love sheep. First of all, I mean, sheep are, I always joke with my husband. I'm like, one day I want to retire and I want to have a sheep farm. And he's just like, why sheep? And I'm like, because they're so pretty. <laughs> I don't know. I just really like those. I love sheep. Um, but they're very, it's a very pastoral scene, um, very comforting kind of uh, scene and card. Um, and she also sent me a lovely kit, which um, has been on my wish list for a while. And I don't think she even knew that. She just said, hey, I want to send you something. And um, she sent me Dimensions Kit called Santa's Midnight Ride. Let's see if I can get it without without glare. But absolutely love the colors in this one. It's a nighttime scene. It's colorful with the toys. Very, very beautiful scene. And I love Santa scenes. So thank you very much, Miss Vanna. You are such a treasure. Thank you for your friendship. And thank you for the gift. It came at a time when I meant a lot. And um just want to thank you for that. Um, I have a couple of other stitchy projects that I'm going to be working on, and I'll save that for um, because they kind of tie in with some of my life updates. And this is the part where I might have to do some editing because I don't know how easy it'll be to get through this part. Um, so I started a new job in January. This is the life up update part, so if you don't want to listen this is the time where you can go, uh, bye, see ya. So thank you for watching if you're leaving now, and I'll see you next time.
for those who want to hear about my life updates, I'll talk about that now. Um, so yeah, new job, January. Some of you know my last job. I was there for six months last year from uh, July through December and it just wasn't the right fit. Um, there, the culture at the company I was at was a little um, stifling and not conducive to treating people very kindly. So, and I don't know that, I, I can't speak broadly across the whole company, but at least in the group that I was in, there were some very supportive and amazing people. And there were a couple that were um, probably, probably had uh, been there too long and a little too comfortable. And um, anyway, I'm, I'm not gonna get into all the negativity of that, but um, I found another position. It's back at my previous company that I actually was with before that but in a whole different department doing something completely brand new for me and I don't know if I talked about this in my last video or not but it's uh, the position is basically um, automation and process improvement uh, and it's uh, it's I have to basically start and stand up a new function within the company that they don't really have a whole lot of exposure to or they don't have a lot of experience with currently um, and it's with robotic process automation. I'm not sure if any of you techies out there who know what RPA is and you're familiar with it, if you know and you have great videos or tutorials that you can pass along to me, that'd be great. Um, I'm basically self-learning how to use um, a software called UiPath. So far it's pretty easy and intuitive. I'm a coder, my background is in coding, so I've been able to kind of figure things out and, um, and, I, and there are some people who have already worked with it in the company that I'm, being, I'm able to partner with uh, for some of the challenges that um, just on the back end with configuration and getting things um, stood up on the servers and stuff but if I'm getting too technical I apologize just fast forward this part um, but anyway so it's working with a technology called RPA UiPath it's robotic process automation which is not building robots it's actually building robotic processes so it's a type of automation but a, an RPA process is something where um, it's People confuse it with, they think that their jobs are gonna be replaced. It's not, it's not integration, it's not, it can be, but what it does is it simulates all of the things that you would do at a keyboard as a person. So for example, data entry. If I'm copying data from a spreadsheet into an application form, or if I'm running a report in one system, and I'm emailing, emailing it to someone else, or if I'm um, sending email reminders, manually anything that you're doing that's manual work that's tedious and monotonous and it's anyway that's what that's what um, RPA can step in and kind of replace those things so it's not replacing applications it's not replacing your financial system it's not replacing your human capital system like Workday or Oracle it's not replacing those it's basically this technology interacts with those and it does the functions that a person would do by interacting with them okay so that's the long part of it that's only one part of my new job. The other part of it is um, business process mapping. And so it's a perfect job for me because I love process improvement. I love working with people and mapping out, here's all the steps in what you do. Here's how we can make it easier. Here's how we can automate certain parts of it. And here's how we can eliminate some of the steps that maybe you don't need to do anymore. Um, so that's my new job. Absolutely love it. It's a good blend of technical where I'm hands-on and it's also strategic where I'm helping to educate and stand up a framework of how we do the work. And um, yeah, so that's my new job. Uh, I started there on January 9th and this next part might be a little harder for me to talk about, but um, a week later on January 16th, it was a Monday, I remember it was a holiday, um, I got the news from my dad that my mom passed away. So it's, that was, you know, it's life changing those of you who have gone through it before some of you reached out to me and thank you for that um so one of my earlier videos back in october i had made a reference to getting some news about a family member back in canada um i got some news that um that i had a family member who maybe wasn't so well and i had made a trip back to visit my parents back then and that was my mom. She had gotten, I didn't specifically say that in my video, but it was it was my mom had gotten a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. And um, 
the, the I guess the um, the step forward for her was to have surgery, and the surgery was um, to have a Whipple procedure. If any of you are familiar, um, or if you've heard of it, uh, I've had a lot of people say like, "Oh, I've heard of that because of um, what's that doctor show, uh, Grey's Anatomy." I guess it, I guess it comes up on that show once in a while, but um, anyway. It, Essentially what they do is they remove part of the pancreas, they remove part of um, the um, the stomach, they, re, and they take the bile ducts and part of the liver, so they kind of rework the organs a little bit there by removing some of the tissues and they, it, it's very, very extensive surgery and it does have some risks and complications. It's gotten to be a more... Uh, a more successful surgery over the years, the last 10 to 20 years, I think they've made really good strides and um, the success rates are very good and recovery is very good. Um, so anyway, the, the, the news was that um, she was gonna be scheduled for that surgery. So the surgery was for almost right away in, in the end of November, or, or I think they had to postpone it once um, and it was gonna be in early December. So um, my brother and I both flew up at the end of October and we were, is it October, November? It's all getting really hazy now. I think it might've been in November, probably early November. Um, we both flew up there, had a good family visit with my parents and um, the, re the reality of it hadn't really set in because at that point we were very hopeful and optimistic. I actually got to go to one of the visits with my mom's surgeon um, her um, oncologist surgeon who was going to be doing the surgery. So everything at that point was very framed very positively, but also, you know, not not cherry coating anything either. It's like, yeah, there are risks and yes, there, this is a very serious thing and it's a long road to reco of recovering after and all the things. So um, I FaceTimed my parents. I, I had, I've always FaceTimed my parents, but um, Every call after that, and it was every night. I I call my parents every night on on FaceTime, and um, so every night's call became a little bit more important to me. And I just made the most of all of those calls that I had with them up until the surgery in December. Um, so December came. My mom went to the hospital. I remember the night before um, mm -hmm. having a really uh, having a really good call and having a really good cry afterward because. You know, and anytime someone's going into a serious surgery, you, you never know. You just don't know. So um, the next morning, I called my dad, um, and it was about four hours into the surgery of when she was supposed to have it. And my dad picked up the phone, and he was at the hospital. And I said, "How's everything going?" And and um, he was like, "Well, we it's been delayed. We've been." waiting a little while and I said oh okay he said yeah your mom's right here you can talk to her so I got to talk to her which was awesome um she's like yeah we it's I got here at six in the morning and they just keep delaying and delaying she was all hooked up she's she was ready to go she had her IEV in she was all prepped for surgery and just ready to go in and ran and after I got off the call with them about half an hour later my dad called and said well they're sending us home I said what what do you mean they're sending you home she was like ready to wheel in she was like in gown she was like prepped like the, they're ready to they're ready to go, to go and he said well it turns out they didn't have enough ICU beds and this surgery requires afterward three or three to four days in intensive care in the ICU unit for recovery because it's that kind of surgery and so he said yeah they didn't have enough ICU beds afterward and I'm thinking they didn't know that before mm -hmm. she got there in the morning but anyway who knows there could have been something tragic that happened that they needed the beds um, so anyway, they sent her home and they rescheduled it and they rescheduled the surgery for, uh, January, what was it? January 11th. So it was a, a month later. And so, um, in a way I was really, I was, I was grateful. I was, it was shocking at first that a surgery just gets rescheduled like that. But I'm, the only thing I'm going to say about that is Canadian healthcare. Those of you who live in Canada, you know, um, my parents have struggled with getting um, appointments and just, it's just struggle, right? Like, yeah, you don't have to pay a lot for up f at, at the point of service, but you're paying for it in your taxes and then you're, I'm saying more than I was going to. Okay, I'm saying more than I was going to. 
um, and you wait a long time. You can wait and be on lists for months for things that you could, in the United States, you would have scheduled within weeks, and in Canada, you can wait months. Okay, I'm done. I promise I'm done uh, on the healthcare part. Okay. So, but in, but in a way, I was a little bit grateful because I got the holidays with my mom. I got the holidays and I had New Year's, Christmas. Um, I think she was a little bit stressed because she just wanted to get it over with. Like that, and that's the thing. She just wanted to get it over with. And I, I didn't blame her for that. She kind of felt like she was putting her life on hold for everything. And, but she never complained. Not once. She had some discomfort. She had some issues. Um, so Within that time, they also were able to do a little bit more testing. Um, they did some biopsies through a scope. They did some cameras where they could try and, and, and scope and see what was going on. And they knew that there was definitely some inflation. Her in, inflation, inflammation, is, we have inflation in a whole different way. Um, inflammation and um, I know this is really long, but this is my story. So if you don't want to watch, just, you know, you don't have to, but this is my story. And I kind of want to document it while it's fresh too, because if I come back and look at this later, you lose details over time and I don't want to lose some of these details. Um, but anyway, they knew there was some inflammation and they also knew with her blood work that the tumor markers were elevated and they were definitely above the numbers they would expect for normal. And, but they were even they had gone up or doubled since September, the last time she'd had blood work done before the actual official diagnosis in October. So all that to say that everything was still pointing to, yeah, there's, there's cancer there. So they still were feeling like, yes, we do need to move forward with surgery. And um, so then January came and I had the holidays and I had my daily calls with my mom and we continue to share. <sighs> okay, I can get through this. So my mom had her surgery on January 11th and she got the, the surgery. My dad called me. He's like, everything went well. She's okay. She's, she's, she made it through the surgery. I mean, I hate to say that, but that was a concern that cause she wasn't, she wasn't the strongest. She was she, very slight. I'm, I'm heavy. <laughs> I'm a heavy person. Like I've, um, but my mom is very petite. She she was lucky to be over 100 pounds through her adult life. She's just very, very petite. And um, if she got up to 105 or 107, she was like, oh my gosh, I'm getting chunky. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. But anyway, she but she's very short too. She was like just barely five feet. So um, anyway, she so she was very slight. And her doctor had told her, her, her surgeon had told her, you need to put on a whole lot of weight because one of the da one of the um, side effects after the surgery is you lose a lot of weight very quickly, like 20 to 30 pounds. And she didn't have 20 to 30 pounds to lose. So I will say she had a very, very enjoyable holiday season, eating lots of chocolates and eating lots of candy and eating lots of whatever she wanted because she did gain, she didn't gain 30 pounds, but she definitely put on some weight that was helping her through the surgery. So, so she got through the surgery. She was on the other side of it. She moved to intensive care. She was in the intensive care unit for three days and doing really well. Um, she was starting to eat. They moved her to a regular room on the end of the third day. And she was eating. She was getting up. She was. She had been walking around um, at day two. I mean, she she was up. Um, my aunt and my and my dad were there. They would, you know. Um, put her in a wheelchair, move her around the hospital, get her out and get her up. And, and she'd been walking around. Um, she was really doing very well. And it was a Sunday night. It was the six, the 15th of January. Um, she was having great conversations. Um, and it seemed like she had this really big boost of 
energy and excitement and happiness. And she had had quite a um, quite a, a lot of pain medication, so she hadn't been fully lucid the first two three days. Like, I mean, she was enough to talk, but you know what it's like when you're on pain medication. You're just a little loopy and not always um, there. But she like really all of a sudden was just like alive, like vibrant and engaged. And my dad said like, oh, she's she's this is it. She's doing great. This she's this she's gonna do amazing. And then it was the next morning on January 16th on a Monday and it was a holiday for me. I didn't have um, work that day and my dad called and he's like, there's been, it's been a, a turn and it doesn't look good. And that was a, that was a tough call for him to make and for me to receive. And um, I just remember a lot of deep breathing and he said, um, they don't know what happened, but it appears that she may have had a heart attack and they checked on her at five o'clock in the morning and she was sleeping and they checked on her at six o'clock and they found her unresponsive and not breathing. So they were able to resuscitate and put her on life support. They put her on a ventilator and they said they needed to do some scans. They did not know how long she had gone without oxygen. So, um, they took her for an MRI and some CT scans. They did all the scans and what it came back with was that they didn't find any, there was no brain activity. So she was gone. Um, so whatever the event was in the morning, they suspected it was a heart attack, but they were not sure a hundred percent. So they were going to do some more tests. And, um, but anyway, they, my dad said they, they told me, I told my dad to tell us that if you have family who can get here, this is the time to come. The problem with being so far away, it's to drive is about 32 hours one way, uh, to fly is about 12 hours if you can get good connecting flights. So um, my dad basically said, I want you to do what you feel is right, but I don't know that they can wait 24 hours. So um, he called me back later in the day uh, and I said, I. I'm okay and I'm at peace with whatever has to be done today and I I know I can't be there. Um, so that's that's how it went. So um, he made the decision to take her off life support at 8 o'clock that night and my cousin was there, my uncle was there, my aunt was there, who was my mom's sister. Um, so my dad wasn't alone, which I'm really grateful for. Um, we have very close extended family. We've always, when we grew up, it, we were very close. So he had people there with him. He wasn't alone. So eight o'clock that night. So I made plans the next day on Tuesday, my husband and I flew up to New Brunswick. Um, my two daughters made the decision to also go up. Um, my, my oldest left school in Georgia and my youngest took time off work from her job and they flew up later that week. And we were all there for the funeral on Saturday and my daughters left on Sunday. And then my, um, my husband and I left, we had plans to leave on Tuesday. Well, Tuesday came and it was a big snowstorm in the morning. So our flights were canceled and they ended up getting like 12, 14, 14 inches of snow, I think in that storm. Um, but we were able to get a flight out later in, in the day. But the good news with that was that my dad had a doctor appointment. So I was like, hey, I'm I'm here. I'm, my brother was still there with his family. So my brother and I ended up going to the hospital with him. It was like a little day surgery kind of a thing. Um, just a procedure, not a surgery, just a procedure. But um, it was uh, another day of shocking news. Um, the results of that procedure were um, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. So his has a much better prognosis and they have since done a procedure that um, removed the tissue, the cancerous tissue internally and um, they say that everything is fine. He's going to be just fine. And it's just, it was just a shock. Like I just went through all of that with my mom and <laughs> then you find out like it just doesn't end, you know? You, you go through the grief, you go through, like I'm better now, but obviously it's still hard to talk about. You don't ever get over it. You don't ever, 
truly stop thinking about your parent when you lose them. You just kind of, you cope every day. Every day you have distractions, right? I feel worse for my dad because he lives in, they had lived in an apartment near the hospital. And um, so he's living there and like he doesn't have her with him. He's great though, like he's, he's the strongest person. He actually, my dad actually conducted the funeral. He sang at the funeral and he did the, the, the sermon at the funeral. He, he's just a strong man. So he, um, yeah, he's, he's doing okay and I'm doing okay. It's just, it's tough. You know, you get the moments where it just kind of hits you all over again. Like, oh yeah, I forgot. But anyway, that's my, that's my, that's where I'm at. Then I came back from, I came back from the funeral and immediately back into this new job. And that felt really awful because I'd only been there for a week and then I was gone for a week and a half. And then I came back and, um, I think it's going to be a great job. Like I said, it, it just, things changed a little bit. And so I'm trying not to stress out so much, but I feel like I've just, I've been just through the ringer with emotions. And so work just feels a little overwhelming but I think that's because it's new it's because of all the other emotions and everything else so um and then I was back at work for a few weeks and then my husband and I had a trip that we went on it was something we've been planning for a very long time it was the first time that he and I had a trip together just the two of us since before we had kids so that was 25 no 25 no my daughter's not 25. 1999 was the year we got married and that was also the last year that we took a trip together, just the two of us. So, um, 24 years ago, I guess, 23, 24 years ago. So this was really, it was, it was really good because the timing of, the timing of having it after all of that gave me a chance to just kind of decompress and we, we ended up going to Hawaii and we went to Maui, just the two of us. It was beautiful. Uh, we went during whale season, so we got to see whales all the time. We went on the water on a couple of boat rides and um, we went snorkeling one day and that was super fun. We saw whales going to and from uh, the snorkel sites and uh, we could even see them from the little uh, lanai balcony from the condo that we stayed at. We could see them and I had some binoculars so I was able to, so that was really fun. I'd never, never imagined that we would have such a fun trip. It was, it was dreamy and it was tropical. And it was, um, if you've been, you know, we went to Maui. And if you haven't been before, I highly recommend it if you can. It, it's, you really do just let everything go. You walk on the beach, you, it's the smells and the, sounds and the birds and the flowers and the tropics and it just it, it was it was really really nice we were celebrating 25 years together it was almost exactly 25 years since we met and almost exactly 24 years since we got married so it was our 24th wedding anniversary that we celebrated but celebrating 25 years together so so that was our trip we really enjoyed it um Missed the kids. It was our first trip without them. And, you know, there were times where we were like, oh, it's just, it's so weird just the two of us without the kids with us. But they're grown. They're in their 20s now. And I know they have their lives and they've kind of launched and they have their own things going on. And it's not to say we'll never have another family vacation again. Um, but it was just, it was a little different. There were times where we were like, oh, I wish, wish the kids were here. <laughs> but but it's okay. Um, it was, it was really good. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the two projects that I, uh, one of them, both of them were projects that my mom started and had been working on. They're cross-stitch. She's, she's also a, a needlework person. And um, one of them, she was almost completely finished working on. It was something she was making for one of her best friends. And I don't have it anymore because the reason that I, I brought it back from the funeral, I brought it, I, my dad said, sure, take whatever you, take whatever you want, her stitching stuff, whatever. And I did, I didn't take all of her 
stitching stuff. I was flying on a plane, so I couldn't take a bunch of stuff. But I took her last two projects she was she had been working on. And she was very much a monogamous stitcher. She would only work on one or two things, most usually just one. But she had two on the go because she had one that was almost done. The one for her friend. And I brought it back to finish it and to frame it and to send it to her friend so that her friend would know that those months leading up to her surgery and leading up through her whole cancer diagnosis and all of those moments up to the point where she passed away, she was thinking about her best friend and working on something that meant that much to her for her friend to have. So I finished it. I don't have it anymore. I'll put a picture in of what it is and um, it was it was a little it was a little challenging to finish. The only thing left were some of the letterings up at the very top in the word friendship. Everything else was done. So she was almost done. Um, so I framed it. I sent it to her friend and her friend wrote back and I mean, obviously it went a lot. So I was glad that I did that. The other piece that I brought back, her other one that she had been working on, she'd been working on it for probably a couple of years on and off. Um, we cut, it, it was when I got her hooked on Mirabilis a little bit. <laughs> um, and she, maybe not hooked on specifically Mirabilis, but she was hooked on Nora Corbett. And there were a couple of Mirabilis that she was wanting to do. One was the the garden series, Summer in My Garden, Autumn in My Garden, Winter in My Garden. So she actually had the pattern ready to go. It's called The Summer in My Garden. This is the one that she was going to do next, but never started. And the one that she did start was, um, if I can find it here. It's um, Nora Corbett and it's Poppy. This is the one that she had started. We actually saw it at, together at a cross stitch store completed and finished on a wall. And she saw it and her jaw dropped and she was like, oh, that's beautiful. And so I sneakily, while she wasn't paying attention, I went and I picked it up and I picked up some fabric and I took it and bought it for her. So on that trip home, it was, it was up in New Brunswick. Um, it was at a cross stitch store in Moncton, New Brunswick called Because You Count and it's closed. It's not open anymore, but there's another one now that's called, um, Stitch Bug. I think it's called Stitch Bug. I haven't had a chance to go there yet. Um, but I hope on a future trip, uh, up to New Brunswick, I do hope to go there. Um, but anyway, I bought the stuff for her and at the end of that trip, I gave it to her and she was like, how did you get that? We've been together the whole time. And Anyway, she didn't know that I snuck away while she was looking around the store. Um, but this will be the next one. I'm I'm going to finish it for her. She always used to talk to me. She's like, I've never done anything with beads before. How am I going to do the beads? You're going to have to show me how to do the beading. And I said, when you get to the point where you're doing beading, you let me know. And, and I'll help you with the beading. So... I'll be honest, this is the first time that I've actually taken out, taken it out and looked at it. So if I have to edit a little bit here, you'll know why. So it's in the Q-snap and I'm going to take it out of the Q-snap. And um, I'll show you how much she got done on it. hard touching things knowing that she was the last one to touch it so and this is this is where she got to on it she got a lot of the dress done she got her hair done she got she got quite a bit done on it she didn't pick it up as she said she never picked it up as often as she wanted to. But I think it's beautiful. And I'm going to finish it for her. She always loved um, white Ada. So she, it's 16 count white Ada. It's not the fabric that I bought for her. I had bought her a different 16 count Ada. Because she loves Ada. Um, 
So when it came down to finally doing it, she's just like, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to use, I'm going to use the white Ada. I really like the white Ada. And I said, you just use whatever you want. Like, don't, that's, you do whatever. She was just always very, she always wanted to ask. I don't know why she always felt the need to ask, but like, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> no, mom, I don't mind. So anyway, this is on my list to work on after I finish the piece for my dad. Obviously, I want to finish the piece for my dad because I want him to have it. He requested it. He said he wanted a red truck. He said all of the things that he liked about, and he and he actually helped me pick out the pattern. And he he would, I never even said, hey, do you want me to stitch something for you? He just said he knew how much I love stitching, and he just said to me one day, I think it was on one of my trips when I was visiting. He said. I'd like for you to make me something. And I said, okay. And he said, I'd like you to make, I'd like you to stitch me a red truck. So we picked the pattern and, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to finish it for him. And I, that's why I'm working so monogamously on just the one. So now, you know, you know what I've been working on, what I've gotten done since the last time we talked, you know, the things that have happened in that time and why I haven't been stitching very much. And I hope to start stitching more now that I'm, I'm back through all of these things and back from the trip that we had. And we just got back actually last Tuesday. So it hasn't really been that long since I've been home, but um, I had to jump back into work and things were a little crazy there, but um, I hope going forward that I'll be able to get some more stitching done and uh, get into a routine, get into just, just need a little bit of normal for a while. I just hope it is. Just a little bit of routine and not craziness. Just need some, yeah, you know, some of you know, others can imagine. I'm really looking forward to Stitch North. I have been really bad about actually going forward with making my plans, my travel plans. Um, so that's something on my on my list of things to do in the next week or so is to finally get my travel arrangements figured out. I know where I'm staying and I know, I just don't know how I'm gonna get there. It's a 12 hour drive, maybe a little more with stops. Um, so I don't know if I want to drive because it's the drive there and it's the drive back. But then if I fly, it's like, well, it's, you know, two hour flight and then you get a couple hours on each side and you're locked into a schedule and you don't have a car when you get there. And I don't know, I'm not sure. I like driving, but I don't know if I wanna go 12 hours. If it was if it was under eight hours, it'd be no brainer. I'd be like, yeah, I could do like six or seven hours. That's no problem. When it gets up to be like 12, that's kind of like, eh. It's a lot when you're going on like a Thursday and, a, and then coming back on like a Sunday or Monday. It just might be too much to try and fit that in. So I'll have to figure that out. The other thing I thought about is if I fly, then maybe I can take the opportunity for the week after that and just fly and visit my dad for the rest of the week. And then the following weekend fly home. So that's another option too I might think about. I don't know if I have anything else to talk about. Oh, I have another thing. I, I'm so sorry. It, ju it just was yesterday. So James, I'm really sorry. It's the end of the video and I'm, I'm, I meant to talk about this earlier in the video. So James, the PH stitcher has sent me a, his very first pattern that he designed himself and he emailed me a copy of it and I'm going to put a picture of it in here. He did an amazing job. It's a fantastic pattern and I'm going to put it on my to-do list. I'm going to put it on my uh, future starts list. I think it's adorable. So James, great job on your pattern. Thank you so much for sending it to me. And I'm looking forward to seeing more of your designs. I hope you have plans to do more. And so that's something else that I meant to talk about. Um, and there's also another pattern. Another first is um, Rika King. House of Stitch and Stash, you, you may know her as well. Um, she had the release of her first pattern and she put a post out on Instagram. I think that's how I connected with her. And she said, I have my first pattern ready for pre-sale if anybody wants to buy it. And I saw it and I was like, yeah, I really like that. 
it's kind of a um, sampler style, which is not usually what I'm what I um, typically go for. I'm, I like some stamp samplers. I'm just very particular about the samplers that I work on. Um, but this one, I just fell in love with the colors and what it says. It's I'm gonna I'm gonna read it first. It says. That's how it began with us. You held out your hand and I took it. It does. So this is what it looks like. That's how it began with us. You held out your hand and I took it. And the timing of this one with the little dog, um, the timing of this one was one where my husband and I were starting to get excited about our um, anniversary trip before the holidays and um, the timing of when she released it I was like I love that so I had plans to work on it and have it done before my anniversary but um, or at least started before my anniversary but um, that didn't happen didn't have any any progress on it but it's a really cute pattern and if I've missed anyone goodness knows I may have I may have missed. I've had so many people reach out with kindness and um, just beautiful words of inspiration and support. Um, I, I can't thank everybody individually, but you all know who you are and you mean so much to me. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for just being there for me the last couple of months. Some of you just randomly would reach out and say, hey, I just wanted to check in on you and see how you're doing. I was kind of dark on the socials. I, I'm on Instagram a little more frequently, but even that I hadn't been on really often. I haven't, I'm way behind on floss tubes. I haven't really watched much um, floss tube in the last couple of months, so I have a lot to catch up on. A lot of you out there have put out some new videos and uh, I need to get out there and watch them. So I plan to do that tonight after I edit this video and get that posted. Uh, it's a longer video than I planned and I I hope it wasn't too rambly but at the same time I wanted to tell my story and if it helps anybody to know what we went through um, yeah then yeah I just yeah I just I just wanted everyone to you don't when you hear about something that somebody else went through and some of the medical stuff and what the risks are and the outcomes like it I think it's good to know I don't think it should scare anyone from taking control of your health and um, you know advocating for yourself and getting second opinions when you can um, the one thing I didn't tell you I wasn't sure if I was going to but I'll tell you um, my mom passed away I wasn't gonna say this. Um, the kicker of the whole thing, her diagnosis, her scans, her test results, her surgery, her um, recovery afterward, the real kicker of this whole thing, the day she passed away, that Monday after she had the heart attack, they found out that, um, they found out that the cause of the heart attack was that infection had set in. So she, the infection set in because of the surgery and the, the, the infection essentially went through her whole body. She went septic and that's what caused the heart attack. Through the result of all of the scans they did that day while she was on life support, they did extensive full body scans and they had also sent off the tissues to the labs that they had removed during the surgery five days earlier. And that day, those results came back, the full body scans, the MRIs, all the CTs, all of the results came back and they found no evidence of cancer. So that's the kicker. She had the surgery for cancer to remove it and she didn't have it. How do they not know that? Like there's just, there's no closure yet. And I think that's why it's still kind of hard. There's no closure yet. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I just try not to go there because 
the way I feel about it, the way my dad feels about it, he's very, he reminds me of this. It's that God has a plan and things happen in our lives and we don't know what, we don't know what that plan is, but God does and things happen in our lives. I truly feel this. And, and if you don't share this belief, like I, no worries. And I hope you don't fault me for believing what I believe, but um, I think God knows everything about us and what's going to happen and the people who come in and out of our lives and whether that's surgeons and doctors or um, this was how it was meant to be. We don't, we don't know the day and time. We just know that um, she's in a better place. She had other health issues. It wasn't like she had a perfect life and then all of a sudden she was gone. She had other health issues too. But, I mean... Yeah, so I struggle a little bit with that, with like the like the why and and what could have been different or how how was it missed? Like how how did they think she had cancer when she didn't, or or did they miss something in the skin? I, it's just you know you can just keep going on and on, or you can just say you know what this is this is okay. I believe that she's in heaven. I think she's with um, with all of my other family and friends and loved ones who are in heaven and. Um, and she's at peace and I just have to kind of, I have to sit in that and dwell there in the positive and thinking through all of the, all the good memories that I have with her. And I have no regrets the last few months, every day, every conversation we had was full of love and yeah. So that's the stuff. That I focus on. Um, yeah. My dad always says, he's like, yesterday's gone and tomorrow's not guaranteed. All we have is today. So make today a good one. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to make today a good day. So I'm going to sign off. It's been far too long of a video and some of you are long gone. Those of you who stuck to the end here with me, thank you. And I will try to come back a little bit sooner next time not wait a couple months and hopefully I'll have a little more progress between now and the next video and I wish you all well happy stitching love on another um that's all we have is love to give and um be well and I never know how to sign off here <laughs> so goodbye